Women make up 70% of the healthcare workforce, but only 20% of its leadership. On her story, we'll explore the careers of bold and influential women from Silicon Valley to Capitol Hill and learn how they've overcome the odds. I'm your host, Sandra Jane, and this is Her Story, a program where we explore what's beyond the glass ceiling. It's my pleasure to welcome Renee De Silva, CEO of the Health Management Academy, to Her Story. Renee, it's so wonderful to have you with, uh, with us today. Thanks for spending some time. Happy to be here. Good to be back with you again. I should preface for our audience that you either have the, the fortune or misfortune of spending time with me today because we have a long history. So for our audience's benefit, Renee is um, a former boss of mine and mentor and sponsor of mine. So really looking forward to spending some time talking about your story. And I can just say that I've learned a lot of lessons from you about leadership and management along the way. So uh, really grateful for Thank what you. you bring to the table. Thank you. I consider it to be a good fortune. So I look really good forward to the time. <laughs> For those in our audience who may be less familiar with the Health Management Academy, could you just share a little bit about what the mission of the Academy is? The mission is really guided by a single principle, which is member at the center. And the way that that comes to life for us is through the power of peer networks. We believe that when you have the right people around the table, you can drive conversations and insights that that really can drive the industry forward. And, and that's the mission of the Academy. And we think that that core foundation of bringing together leaders from healthcare systems and from industry companies then creates a flywheel around providing insights that can be scaled across the industry. And so your background then is really unique from studying public administration to leading sales and marketing for really the country and I guess global leader in healthcare research and consulting to now leading the Health Management Academy. Do you consider your foray into leadership to be healthcare leadership specifically to be accidental or intentional? It's a great question. So I probably a few months ago would have said a bit um, um, accidental path, but I was reminded recently, I had a, a high school friend whose mom digitized our three years of our high school experience and she uploaded a YouTube link and uh, a re that really captured that. And what I noted about myself, which I didn't really remember now many, many years later, is I naturally gravitated to moments to be in front of my class, to find ways to lead. And so I do think that that core principle was in my, my DNA. And then um, my first job and my job throughout all of, of, of high school was working at Rhode Island Hospital. Now this was in the main kitchen serving food to patients, but I do remember then being struck by what a great job it was. At that time, I felt like I made a lot of money for you know a 16 year old and just being struck by the operational 24 seven drumbeat of hospital. So I think in hindsight, it was probably more intentional than I truly appreciated. Wow, I didn't know that. So one of your first jobs was actually in a hospital. It's it fun to see that come full circle. Yes. So what was life growing up in Rhode Island and how do you think that shaped your career ambitions at that time when you were you know, you know, know, high school, but even earlier than that? So Rhode Island, smallest state in the nation, um, very tight community, how that plays out when you're growing up and especially with my dad who was a UPS truck driver. So literally, quite literally trafficked across the entire state is I felt like everywhere I went, I was being watched and somebody knew me. <laughs> and so I, I do think um, that sort of does shape a really tight knit community, uh, feeling like you've got people rooting for you um, along the way. I also went to a, a small Catholic school from k kindergarten through 12th grade. I think that was pretty fundamental and sort of how I, I was raised. So I think it was um, this very small, uber connected community where I always felt like whether I liked it or not, <laughs> there was always somebody around watching and, and, and aware of, of me and my family. So then you went off to Syracuse, studied public administration. After graduating, what were you wanting to do post-graduation? The university did a great job bringing employers to us. And so I landed at Accenture, and I, I landed that role well before I'd graduated. And what I was struck by at the time was this notion of um, – a large company that invested significantly in teaching and training, maybe people who were good thinkers, but really didn't have much te technical acumen at the time. Um, and I, I loved process. I loved figuring out puzzle pieces and how they came together. And so my first job at Accenture was, and this is before they could even bill me to the client because I really didn't have much by way of skill set, was just mapping process flows for a large consumer products company and just seeing how all that fit together. And so I loved the nature of that work. And um, it, it, I do think I still draw on that in terms of how do you think thematically and really figure out how to bring things to life. 
Um, and that, that served me really well. I ended up, um, becoming more technical than I had imagined. And I was spending a lot of time in heads down roles and I love, I'm pretty extroverted. I, I, I get energy from being in front of people and talking to people. And so I randomly on a whim said, I need a new job. Let me try sales. Because I felt like in my my 22 year old head at the time, that was a good example of places where you'd have to spend a lot of time talking to people. And so I quite uh, randomly settled at a company called the Advisory Board, and and that was my sort of first commercial role. And I spent then 18 years at that same company in largely different roles. But that's sort of how I landed in healthcare as a chosen career path and profession. So at that point, when you were thinking about the different roles, was it more about the function or was it about this desire to go in healthcare? I'm sure there's probably elements of both, but how were you thinking about that? I think at the time it was two forces. One was just the function of um, trying something that was a bit scary, like leaning into something that I felt like I was not prepared for. And the nature, I wouldn't have, you know, I don't think I would have taken a sales role in any function, but the, the, the job that I had in my very maybe early to mid 20s was meeting hospital executives across the country, sharing with them our, our broad portfolio and trying to engage with them. And if you think about, you know, then it was less consolidation than there is now in the industry, but it was a very much a masterclass in learning healthcare from the lens of individual providers in local markets. I met with providers from Texas to Maryland, so very different geographies. And it was, it was just fascinating how much you could tell from what the local environment dictated, from the style of the leader. And so I think, um, and then just the mission, like the mission that really motivated the work. So I think it was those two factors that led me to stay committed to a healthcare career path. And then I, you know, I had the good fortune of landing with a company that invested behind my growth. And so I grew as it grew. And I think that afforded me opportunities that I would have otherwise missed. As part of that, I mean, you are, you're too humble to say this, but you are by far the finest, you know, sales and marketing talent out there. I mean, I've learned a lot of skills from you along the way. Um, you rose up the ranks at the advisory board and, you know, had a phenomenal career there. And I know that was it what, a little, bit, little over 15 years you spent there. You've been, you've had your pick of the choosing of different roles along the way, but what's rare in today's society is it's, you almost don't hear of people staying at one organization for more than a handful of years. And so I'm curious, like, how did you think about, you know, why you decided to stay there for as long as you did and then when it was time to ultimately leave? Sales for me is really a platform for growth. And I talk a lot about that with, with our team here today. I don't want to sell unless it brings impact to an organization um, the, the, or the, in terms of the member or the client, but it also creates opportunities for internal talent. And so I think I stayed that long because there was always an emphasis on growth as a platform in terms of career trajectory and impact on the industry. And so it felt back to mission. It felt very mission focused. And then I will say um, I, I landed there very young in my career. So that I, I, you know, part of it just may have been you end up, they say, Gallup says, what's the number one predictor of somebody staying in, a, in their company? It's do they have a best friend at work? And I had several of them. I had several people who I, you know, to this day, I'm, I meet with monthly for our, our women's supper club. Um, and so I, I think it was a combination of the work, um, the, the people that I consider to be friends. And then I had managers who always gave me more than I could handle. So I didn't get bored. And I think that's a really good combination for spending 15 plus years in any one place. So then after that, you decided to go on to EAB. What, what prompted that decision? Yeah, it's a hard pivot, right? Like someone who grew up in commercially oriented roles, I, I went to the education uh, division or the education company as a chief talent officer. So, you know, HR and, and, and governance and how do you think about recruitment, all the things that aren't necessarily part of a traditional commercial path. But that's a little bit of my point of um, over time, I really began to note like where I got energy and um, where I might be able to make an impact. And I tried to be quite directive um, with the teams that I worked with and my upward managers around that. And so when EAB was, was carved out of the advisory board, it was taken private while uh, the advisory board healthcare division went to uh, Optum. And so it was this really interesting opportunity to build a company a little bit from scratch because you had to stand it up as an independent, fully functioning, high-performing unit. And in a function that I had dabbled in through a broader 
a commercially oriented path, but I wouldn't say I have a traditional HR. And um, what a gift for someone to trust me with that opportunity of leading a talent organization for 1,400 people. And it, it just was um, work that I really love. If you would have caught me even three and a half years ago, I would have told you I would have been doing that work even today, but life happens and you know you end up making other changes. Right. Well, I know you were just getting started at EAB and really enjoying that when you were approached to come on as president and CEO of the Academy. Tell us a little bit about kind of that decision-making process and you know how you reconciled that. So it's funny, when I first received the call from the executive search firm, I said, thank you, but I'm really happy doing what I'm doing and it's just not a good time. And, and, and I hung up that phone call and in the back of my mind, I sort of th- thought to myself, gosh, like why would I not explore a CEO role? How many times does a CEO role cross your desk? And what was my real reason for, for not being willing to explore that? Was it that I just was so loving what I was doing? Was there some fear? Was there some imposter syndrome perhaps underpinning my desire to just not even look at it? And so I sat with that, for, chewed on that for a few days. She called me back and said, Renee can you at least take a single phone call? And so I took the phone call. And then after that call, I was like, man, I now know that I really, <laughs> I really want this to happen. Um, and it was, you know, it, it, there was something unique to the academy opportunity that I felt like I was uniquely suited for. I had spent all of my career in healthcare at a membership-based organization. I knew the market really well. I had a perspective on convening and and eventually growing more insights out of that. And so I felt like if not this opportunity, what would prompt me to move? And I think I would have been really disappointed in myself if I didn't take a little bit of a leap of faith and try something that felt like I was ill prepared for in some ways. Um, but I, uh, hindsight being 2020, it was, it was really one of the best decisions that I've made. And I know in those early days, you and I had a conversation uh, before you even came on full time. And one of the things you had shared was you consulted your family. And so when you talk about timing, you know, you have three kids and we'll, we'll talk, come back to that in a minute. But what was that conversation like with them knowing that, you know, this role would have a lot of travel and, you know, you know taking on a CEO role is pretty intense. What was the inside baseball conversation? I spent a lot of time dwelling on that because I guess at the time my kids were like tweens, which a lot of times you feel like um, when you're raising kids that the early toddler years are like you are the hardest to miss. In some ways, I feel like the stakes get a lot higher as they get older. And so I, I was um, I was fully aware that if I made this decision, I would have to lean all the way in. And that that would require a different level of energy and focus and rigor than, than, than my current role did. Not that I wasn't working hard, but it's just a different energy. So my, my husband was number one, yes, you should absolutely do it. And so I think if he had any reservations, that would have made it hard because he does, like in the spirit of one of the best decisions you can make is to pick the right partner. He is all in on my career path and I would not have been able to make it happen if he was not willing to like, do the day-to-day stuff that sometimes I just don't get to. Um, I have an adult daughter who was at the time in her early mid twenties, and she was so proud of even the opportunity, and that helped. Like being a having feeling like you had a cheerleader there, like saying, "Mom, why would you not do that? That's really cool." And then my son, who was maybe nine at the time, didn't really care. And then my middle daughter, you know, she 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 also thought um, that it, it would be something that I should absolutely consider. So full support of the family. And that did make a big difference in terms of just knowing what it would take and can still continues to take to, to just continue to um, stay uh, active and really engaged in the work that's fascinating, but there's, there's a lot that needs to get done. Absolutely. And so going into the role, kind of before you even started, take us back to at that time, what was Renee thinking about, this is what I want to achieve? Interestingly, as I got to know the, the organization um, from the lens of the founders and the, the folks that were there, the employees, even members that I knew in a different context, interestingly, my first thought was first, do no harm. Because it was and is a very special place in terms of privileged access and relationship depth, hearts and minds of people in healthcare that are just doing the work that it is what I believe will transform the industry. And so I really wanted to more approach this as it was already a thriving community of engaged executives. It had a great team of talent. Um, it had a um, you know a membership base that really loved the academy. And I, first thing I was like, Renee, just don't mess it up. Like go in and listen and learn and then come up with a series of observations. And so that's, that's really what I did for probably the first 12 months of my role. 
And I, I think that I, I would hope to think that that has served well. Absolutely. Well, I was there and I th- think you did a beautiful job of that. You really, I, if I remember correctly, you actually met with every single employee and you sat down and you did, you know, kind of reflections and listening and you did that with many of the members too. And I think that served you very well. I'm curious, you know, your background going from Accenture to the advisory board to EAB. I mean, those are pretty large established organizations and they're, you know, pros and cons to, to each of those. What was it like transitioning to not only a new role, but a environment that was much smaller, was more of a growth stage company, probably didn't have all the processes and infrastructure. I mean, you know, we joked that the offices were, you know, very different too. (laughs) Yes. I mean, the beauty of of that is the decision making is clean. Um, There is not a ton of bureaucracy. You can be truly guided by right answer. Um, and not, um, you know, having to not having to think through what your stakeholders in terms of like if you're a publicly traded company might view that. So, the beauty of it was the long view, growing but growing in a principled and thoughtful way. And so there was a lot that was good with it. I think the biggest challenge, and I know that you 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 certainly felt this, is our ambitions and the pace at which we want to move sometimes outstrips our resources. So in a small company, there isn't redundancy. There aren't established processes. We didn't even have a customer relationship management platform. And so it feels like you have so much energy and enthusiasm for the work, but things just take a little bit longer because the infrastructure is not there. Now, going back to my Accenture days, I I do love process. And and so in some ways that wasn't a negative for me, but I do have a reflection on one reflection on that. It wasn't a negative for me, but it was, it did feel like it made things slower. That being said, while it wasn't a negative, one of my biggest learnings in my CEO role is to be careful that the things that you're good at Aren't, that you don't only spend time on those things when really where your energy should be might be in, in different um, might be in different places. And so I would say that that was an early reckoning that I think I had to have. Well, that's really good advice. I mean, on the flip side of that, you're kind of alluding to some of it, but I'm just curious, what were some of the biggest challenges for you just personally, whether it was the mindset or the energy or just strategically? of those first few months as CEO? I think a big one was finding my place and my voice among our members. And so, you know, because the size, the nature of the size, it had been founder led for 20 plus years. It was um, in many ways um, having to think through how do I earn the trust that had been engendered by the founders with our members and feel like they they trust me in my direction, but also recognizing that I need to do it in a way that's authentic to me. And that's going to look different, like it's going to physically look different, it's going to feel different, it's going to be different, and that is okay. But it, it did take me some time to really settle into that rhythm. And I would say that was probably one of the the places that I had to be just the most thoughtful about, you know, um, continuing the legacy and tradition, but doing it in a way that felt like I could only be me. I'd be a poor version of anybody else. And so it just took me a little bit of time to to settle that in my own head. Do you remember there was one academy meeting we were at and maybe a couple months in and, you know, everyone, you had fully taken over the reins. And I think there was, you know, a member that had come to you and said, you know, hey, can you point me in the direction of the CEO? And you're like, that would be me. Do you remember, do you remember that? Yeah, it was. I introduced myself and I think someone said, oh, what do you do here? <laughs> <laughs> I do whatever needs to be done. But yeah, and that was it intentional or aspirational. I don't think I was necessarily ever striving for like a CEO title per se. Um, so in those moments you sort of take in stride, but at the same time, you do want to be intentional around making sure that the, your team members and, and the, the members and clients that you serve have confidence in the direction. So yes, that, that t- took a little, uh, look, took a little time to get that right. So you mentioned, you know, you were basically the second CEO after the founders who had been there for a, a long time. And, and that's, that's pretty tough and also comes with opportunities. Wearing your kind of internal hat, you know, I know HR and talent and culture, all that's really important to you. How did you think about kind of influencing and managing that dynamic where you have a whole host of employees who had been there many since the founding, that you were also growing and bringing on new talent and people that you knew? What was that like? The fact, and and we had a more, there are different ways that you can do a founder transition. I, I think we handled ours nicely in that there was a significant period of overlap. And so I did, I did benefit from that in that I didn't have to worry about miss like balls dropping because there was someone who had a longitudinal view. And, and I, I, at least initially 
just seeded some of that work and didn't feel like I had to do everything. I think there's a lesson in that too, around like pick your spots and be, be intentional around what you think you can uniquely contribute to. And sometimes that means like leaving some things for others. And so I think for the first 12 or 18 months, I just seeded um, pieces of the business that I knew that I wanted to get more involved in, but it didn't have to be day one. So I think that was the first piece. I felt like a big part of my inflection could be on talent and culture and org infrastructure and in a company that we don't produce product, like it's all individual IP. If you don't have a strong, engaged team member community, you're in pretty big trouble. And so I feel like I could uniquely contribute to that. And then just being willing over time to reevaluate where I could be of highest and best use and just be willing to make those changes over time. So looking back, is there, you know, as a first time CEO, what would you advise to other first time CEOs? Maybe something that you wish that, you know, you were made aware of or advice that you had been given. Any thoughts there? I do think a big piece of it, and there's probably two things I would distill it down to is really take the time to understand the business. Because even though I felt like the diligence process that I went through, I, I felt like I was in a mutual evaluation. I think the founders and um, the our strategic partner, Welsh Carson, did a beautiful job making everything as plain as possible, but you still have to learn. So really just um, no job is too small, really getting deep, understanding, and just understanding the nuances that you only know over time uh, would be the first thing. The second thing would be just um, really thinking through the, the team that you put in place and suspending ego in some ways, you know, just figuring out, how, again, if you're grounded by member at the center, like what, make sure that that really dictates how you, how you spend your time. And then I do think that a big part of it, and, and maybe there's a way to short circuit it, but it, it does come down to just being comfortable in your own shoes and being unabashed in your, um, in your willingness to just do what you think is, is right answer, because that's ultimately what you were hired for. So you've got to learn the business. You've got to have the right team. You've got to get input, but you have to be comfortable in the wearing being in those shoes and sometimes there there can be a little bit of a self-talk like a you know a track in your head that can undermine that if you're not careful or at least that's true for me and i would say anyone that i've ever worked with would not say that i suffer from confidence or 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 that but there there's something to the role in the title that can um that you just need to be mindful of as you as you settle in and you don't you just sort of continue to be you because that's what you, that's why you, you were hired. That's why I, that's why I was picked for the role. So to unpack something you said earlier, because I think this is, um, and I'm maybe biased because I've had the honor of working with you, but you have this incredible ability to really suspend your ego in, in your words, right? Like you are good about saying, these are my strengths. This is something that I do want to spend time on. This is something that I, you know, feel good about, or this is where I need input. Like you're really good about that self-awareness and you're very intentional about thinking about these are the roles and hats that I want to play at different points in time, kind of to your point about where to focus. One of the decisions you made early on, which I thought was really incredible, is you decided to kind of carve out a piece of your original role and kind of title and bring in someone else to take on the president role. Talk a little bit about kind of that process and, and why you did that. That was probably more guided by my belief that the very best thing that I can do is attract talent to this organization. And I am really uniquely positioned in my ability to do that for the organization. And so um, I learned that along the way that, you know, uh, always hire folks that could do your job and, and don't be afraid about that. Like don't have any reservations around that. So what what I ended up doing was um, there's a, a Patrick whom I've worked with in the past. Um, we have some overlapping skills, but we are very different in terms of how we see the world and, and how we approach problem solving. And I knew that while the academy had a really thriving community that's peer based um, in, in our focus, we, we want to grow. Right. Any company that can have impact has to grow. And, and he was much, he's so smart on thinking about thoughtful ways to expand and, and launch new products. And so you know, I, I could already see fast forwarding a couple of years where we would have to go. And, and so you, you, if you can get talent and be opportunistic about that and, and be willing to like make things like title, not an issue, it, it serves me well and it serves our members well, and hopefully it serves our team members well. So that was guided by just being relentlessly focused on building the best talent and, um, not, you know, not, not letting a, like a title change for me be the thing that held that back. 
So you just celebrated your uh, three-year anniversary as yes. CEO. Congratulations. Yes. I'm curious, you know, you, you've been talking a lot about, you know, trying new things, learning as you go. I'm sure the things that you were thinking about in those early months and years are different than what they are today. Talk a little about kind of the evolution of, you know, where you're spending your time, you know, today versus those early days and maybe what's something that you're, that's kind of your new learning curve today. About 18 months into my tenure uh, for a company that does 65 live events a year, it's, it's often how people know us and, and, and where the affection comes from, COVID happens and we have to completely halt that part of our business, which is a, a major driver for us. Um, and so I feel like my, my, where that sort of transitioned me in terms of time spend was around pivoting and figuring out how do we continue to serve members well in a different and kind way. And so what I've seen happen to my role over time, and I don't know that I anticipated this when I took this position, was I am far more externally facing and outwardly focused than I am internal. And that, again, I love, you know, chief talent officer background. I, you, I would be very happy if I never left this building and, and, and just, you know, did, did the work on the team. But the role that I can uniquely play is with our members and being out front and leading a lot of our, our content development with our CEOs and trustees in particular. And that, like, that is the core foundation. And so that is where I have for the last 18 months been really focused. And that, that did take, you know, back to this. I've heard our, our member CEOs talk about this a lot. There is the trap of just, you know, reinforcing where you get your energy from and continuing to spend time on it and, and maybe underdeveloping other skills. And so I really worked on content stewardship, being the, um, the voice at our senior executive table with our members. And, and I'm like, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this. And I, and I, and I like it too, which, which if you would have asked me that 18 months ago, I would not have been so sure. So that I would say would be the biggest shift for me in terms of time spend um, and one that I didn't anticipate, but one that I, that I'm really enjoying and that we have a great team. And so in terms of operations and managing pipelines and running new product evaluations, I spend less time on that, which is fine by me. Well, I think underlying a lot of that too is kind of this approach you have that you're you're willing to try different things and, and embrace new kind of things that might be uncomfortable to start. And you know, I think you're doing a beautiful job at that. And during COVID, you also started hosting a podcast too, so you're doing a lot of fun new initiatives. I did. I do. I will say though, I prefer being on this side of the mic. So, <laughs> yes. Well, you're very versatile. You can play both host and guest. I think there's a lot I, I want to dig into on the co front because I think it really um, is worth highlighting that the core product, so to speak, of the Academy really was that convening. And I, we might have to have you back for a part two to, to unpack that more, but just you know, for, our, for our audience's benefit, I think just noting that how you have kind of rallied the, the team internally and innovated and kind of figured out ways to do hybrid models and a bunch of different, different ways to learn and provide content basically to the industry at this time of crisis uh, was no easy feat. So kudos to you on managing through that. Maybe shifting gears a little bit, you see this um, all day, every day, and think a lot about this and working with member CEOs. It's it's no secret that very few women, particularly women of color, are in CEO type roles. I'm sure you have numerous stories on this in terms of how some of your experiences have been different because of the fact that you are a woman of color. But I'm curious, kind of playing the CEO hat, how have you um, kind of encountered you know, receptivity towards you because of, you know, your gender and race and, and how has that kind of come into play? Yeah, it's, it's been, it's an interesting, it's an interesting journey. So my reflection on it would be that I am always aware that even today, most of the time, I'm, I'm the, maybe not the only, but I'm, I'm one of few women in the room and I'm often the only person of color. And I guess my choice on that is I can, I can let that drive a narrative in my head, or I can use my lived experience um, to try to use my voice and platform to move conversations around it. And I would say, you know, back to your, how has my time shifted and changed over, over the years? You know, I, I think there was probably a point in time where you are so heads down trying to focus on your own career that you maybe you're not doing enough to really be a voice and 
and and really drive conversations. And I've, I've tried to push myself on this through some of the writing that I've done, some of my own storytelling around my own family's encounters around, um, in this case, it was my brother's death um, at the hands of a police officer. This was on the heels of George Floyd. I've tried to talk about um, that, you know, we need to do more as individuals to not be colorblind, but really be more aware of how somebody's experience, lived experience impacts um, how the world sees them and, and maybe sometimes how they see themselves. And so I think to those of us who, for whatever, whatever it means to make it, but if you're now in the room and you're now at the table, how, are, how am I creating more space for others at that same table? And so that, that's sort of where my current thinking is on it. And I think maybe over time, um, I have been more comfortable leading from the front on that. And that, like that, that to me feels like, um, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the ability for, for me through my own personal voice and platform, but also just some of the things that the Academy is doing to really drive that forward. Right. It, I mean, I think you have just been a phenomenal, you know, lead by example in that and kind of elevating your voice to kind of draw awareness to a lot of those issues. So thank you for doing that. It's interesting. You were actually the, the first person to teach me about the difference between mentorship and sponsorship and how, I'm interested in kind of who those kind of what those roles have played in your journey and, and kind of what type of feedback you've gotten along the way to kind of prepare you for what you do today. I was fortunate to land under a manager middle of my career that um, that really played both. So what he did for me was two things. And if, if you find yourself with a manager who's not doing these things for you, it could be career limiting. I, I you know, I tell friends in my circle this all the time. So he did two things for me. One was um, he helped me to see my gifts that were not always plain to me. And, and he would, you know, note things that I did that just might be reflective like, or re like part of my own reflex, not reflective, but part of my own reflex that didn't know that that was anything special. So he allowed me to understand what my, what, how I contributed in a way that was really helpful to an organization um, that could be a little bit of a, you know, sort of a power alley in terms of other places that I could go. So that was the first thing he did. Um, we also had this culture and it was, um, one of, one of the, one of the cultural tenants was run to criticism. And so how that played out was when your work product or how you did in a meeting was about to get totally torched, they would say, in the spirit of running to criticism, let me give you, <laughs> let, let me give you some feedback on how that presentation went. And he was also ruthless about doing that for me, like really telling me what my blind spots were. And I do think to your question on mentorship and sponsorship, you know, I think part of the issue sometimes can be that for whatever reason, women do not get enough feedback on, on both the gifts and the, hey, here's something that may or may not be true, but here's how people are receiving you or perceiving you and things that are going to be rate limiting if you don't work on it. And Adam did both of those things for me with, you know, with empathy and, and he's very funny. And so he did it with a lot of humor too. Um, and so I would, I would say, that he, you know, he, he comes to mind as the, the best example of that. And then there were others along the way, but when I really needed it, he did both for me. And I, I thank him to this day because I, I think I probably uh, would, would have gotten in my own way without that. Well, as you would say, feedback is a gift and I couldn't agree more. With that, to your point on running to criticism, what's been one of the most difficult pieces of, of feedback you've gotten and how did you overcome it? Yeah, so I, I usually say feedback is a gift, even though when it's even when it's hard to receive. And so um, my best example of this would be, I was um, taken through a leadership development program, and as part of that process, we had a 360. But it was like not a normal 360. It was the, the normal parts: your upward, your, your sort of direct reports, your manager. Mine also included my cousin, who was basically a sister, a roommate. We'd gone through elementary through college together. She was in my 360. An older cousin who was a mentor to me, and at the time, my 10 year old daughter. So <laughs> in the spirit of getting a lot of feedback and difficult feedback, um, that, you know, and, and they, and this company that did these 360s knew that they were going to push on pain points. And so you, the delivery of that was in a corporate apartment in New York city so that you could emote in any way that you would naturally emote when this feedback was shared. And there are two things that still sting to this day that I, that I remember from that conversation. So the first was, um, a really large gap in terms of how my team viewed me and this category of others, right? The others would be people who were in your orbit, who are peers, but not direct reports. My team like felt that I cared for them. We had a good connection. Um, they felt like I advocated for them. The others, as they were, like they were grouped as others on the, um, on the report, 
felt like I was transactional, that I had my own agenda and nothing else mattered. And so I knew that if I ever wanted to have a role with a larger scope of influence, you need the others, the people who are in your orbit to be your biggest fans. And so, so that was pretty, that was a, that was a pretty big piece of feedback for me that I had to adjust. And the second one that I remember was, um, this might be driven by, I had my first daughter in college. And so I entered the workforce with a three-year-old. So I've always had to be uber efficient. And the flip side of efficiency is transactional and maybe callous, right? Because you're just trying to get through things and like keep moving. And so that th those two strings of feedback of the others aren't quite feeling you, Renee. They're not, you know, you've got some work to do there. And it's because you're coming across as transactional was, you know, whether or not I agreed or not, which, uh, you know, I didn't push back on it because I could see the, 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 the truth in that. It, what, it, I had to work on it. So that, that probably still, I remember that to this day, that, that, that long afternoon in New York. I think that efficiency piece is, is really fascinating and something that probably a lot of folks have, have not drawn attention to. So I appreciate you calling that out. As someone who did enter the workforce as a mom and it's, you know, still raising uh, children today, what advice would you have for other women who are juggling these demanding careers and a family? Yeah, I think the thing that we sometimes forget to tell people is that it does get easier the, when you be, the, the more senior that you become. And so my first advice to people that I've worked with is like, just don't, don't, don't opt out too soon. Because there is a period of time where it is really hard. Um, and you feel like you could be at a breaking point. But if you have a good friend network or, you know, other, other uh, good child care around you, I always urge people just to try to get through the hardest parts because it does get easier over time. Um, it gets easier over time in part because you learn how to really pick your spots and to find a way to get things done and to still uh, have the type of family life that you want to have. And then, you know, the more senior you get, as you have greater earning potential, you can also um, outsource things. Like, I don't think we talk about this enough as, as busy professionals. Like you don't have to do all the things, right? You can find ways to get things done that are, um, that are good for your time. So I think it's just this, don't opt out too soon. It, it, it does get easier. And I, I do think the more meaning you find in your work, the more you can balance and, and maybe balance is like a bad word in my mind. Cause I don't yeah. know if I balance There's no such thing. Day, the more you can integrate, right? Because if you find meaning and purpose in what you're doing and you also find meaning and purpose in your, your life outside of work, it, you know, it feels your cup may be full, but you don't feel necessarily cracked. And so that, that's the piece that um, I always try to go back to with folks who are on the earlier sides of that journey. Related to that, you're really good both kind of internally with um, teammates and, and employees and staff and then externally even with, with members and clients of kind of setting boundaries between personal and professional and you're very encouraging of others to do the same. How do you, what, what kind of advice do you have for others who are, you know, know that they want to do that, but, you know, struggle to kind of draw some of those lines? Well, thank you for that because, uh, you know, to me, it doesn't always feel like I, I do that well. Sometimes I feel like... Um, it's, you know, there are moments where I feel completely maybe taxed or tapped from a professional side. And then there are others where I feel like home is getting in the way of, of me bringing everything I need to bring to work. So I'm glad it at least looks like on the surface that that's happening. I mean, I think it comes down to giving yourself a little bit of grace. Um, I, I did, one reflection I do have on that would be um, this notion of on and off ramps. So I have thought about this throughout my career and I have at times noted when I needed to be a bit of a, like on an off ramp. And, and sometimes that's had to do with kids, but sometimes it's had to do with parents. Sometimes it's had to do with my own, like, you know, where I, where I was myself, like just mentally and, and energy wise. And so these on and off ramps don't underestimate those. And I think for those to work, meaning like sometimes you're really leaning all the way in and sometimes you just need a minute. If you end up with the right company and with the right manager, you can act. I've had those conversations live with my my managers in the past, and and they've, you know, so sometimes that means you know what. Unfortunately, I can't take anything else on because there's just too much going on personally. And other times I've said like, hey, it's a good moment for me. Like, what else can I do to be helpful? So there's power in the on and off ramps. That would be that would be one thing I would note. Um, and then, you know, on the boundaries piece of it, I do think that does come with some some practice. And so like highest and best use 
what can I do uniquely? And this, this is not just from like having the CEO role. I've had to do this my entire career, but um, um, what can I uniquely do? And then something else we don't talk about is not everything needs to be done at an A standard. Like some things can be a B and or C, like some things can be deprioritized. The danger is if you're only doing this in your head and you're not managing expectations around it. So if, if I'm sort of saying this is going to be done to a B and my, my, my manager thinks it should be done to an A, then we have a problem. But noting that and being really explicit around how, like, what does good look like and sometimes not letting perfect be the enemy of good, I think that's um, sometimes how I've, if, if it appears as if I'm managing that well, those are some of the things that I've thought about over time. I love that. That's a, that's a great analogy. So, and then as part of that, I mean, you're, everyone has kind of their personal outlets and hobbies and things that they do for them. I know that, you know, from dancing and karaoke, to working out, you've got a whole host of them, but what's kind of the one ritual that you have for yourself to decompress and, and find your me time? Okay. So I'm working on finding a real hobby. Um, I, don't, I don't know if karaoke counts as a hobby. I'm very bad at it. So I'm working on a hobby, but I would say the the thing that, I, that I'm doing when I feel like I'm in my flow, and this may be a cheat because at some point it will end, is I love sports um more i'm not athletic i love observing sports and so um i have a basketball player and two volleyball players and like time stands still for me when i'm just engaging in that i just get so much energy around it and i i love that and so um that's a big part of where i spend my time outside of work and then um increasingly i'm loving to entertain and so we've been hosting through the pandemic these things called soul sundays at my house which is basically watching a football game with a pot of chili and everybody brings a side. And I like that, I find having that on a Sunday makes my weekends feel better. And so I'm looking forward to Soul Sundays now that football season is back. I love that. So who's your yeah. football team? Well, I'm from Rhode Island. So I'm a Patriots fan, which usually people boo at that moment. But, I, I, but, but I've been a Patriots fan long before Tom Brady, and I, I still root for the Pats. <laughs> okay, well, we're borrowing Tom Brady down in Tampa these days. So. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm rooting for him still. Anytime that you can be 44 and still competing at that level, I, I, you got to give him some respect for that. Well, Renee, this has been phenomenal. So I guess I'll wrap us up with kind of two final questions. Um, one is kind of coming full circle, like what advice would you give your younger self? Well, she wouldn't listen. <laughs> um, that part I do know. You know, I guess I would say to my younger self is is just to take a breath. Like I, I do feel like sometimes life is long. I mean, it, life is short, but life is also long. And I feel like I have over. I feel like throughout my life and career, I have sometimes put undue pressure for speed and urgency. Like I've always lived very urgently. And so um, I, I, I would probably say, like, just take a breath. It's, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. And, and that would probably be, that would probably be the, the biggest thing. Because I, I do think that, like, you know, that, that when you are an achiever, which I know you are when you're an achiever, like, you feel like you've got to do everything in a linear way and just sort of get things done. And, and so just, like, give it, take a breath, and it will be, it will be fine. It's probably what, I, what, probably what I needed to hear 20 years ago. I think that's a good reminder for, for all leaders, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I think in healthcare in particular, just kind of the nature of the work and the industry, and you know, I know even just during COVID, right, that, that sense of that urgency, that's a, that's a tough thing to, to reconcile with, but that, that's good advice. So then final question, you mentioned you're you know, doing some writing now, and you, know, you are just undertaking a lot of really impressive initiatives. As you think about the autobiography that's going to be written about you one day, what would be the title of your book? I need a good, I need a good editor that might want to change this title, but the immediate thing that I think about when you ask that question, which stands in direct opposition to what I just said, and the, 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 the first part of that question is make it happen. And by that, I mean, I think we all underestimate our own sort of personal um, influence, platform, abilities, power, like power, like not power over, but power with the ability for one individual to inflect something is not small. So I would say make it happen. Love it. That, that, that's a perfect book title. You don't need an editor for that. Okay, good. <laughs> I just need a ghost writer if I'm ever going to write something, but yes, <laughs> that's for another day. Maybe you'll do it in the audio format on your podcast. Who knows? Indeed. Great. Well, Brene, thanks again for spending so much time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. This was fun. 